Welcome. My name is Ellen Bierenbaum. By way of introduction, I'm a gardener and love the beauty and harmony of my Orient garden in the North Fork of Long Island. What I want to share with you is that my garden, with the addition of well-chosen native plants and shrubs, now also feeds insects and birds and helps restore biodiversity. I hope my presentation will help you do the same. Berries for Birds, a community approach to promoting birds and biodiversity. This is a North Fork Audubon Society initiative in partnership with Homegrown National Park. Here are the broad strokes of my presentation. Berries for birds, insects for life. But first, a few background concepts. An ecosystem is defined as a community of living organisms interacting with each other and the surrounding environment. An example is a freshwater tidal creek in the Hudson Valley, marine eelgrass meadow in Mishomak Preserve, and coastal oak laurel forest in Cold Spring Harbor State Park. Let's next define plant categories. What are native plant species? Plants that are historically or currently present in a particular ecosystem as a result of natural evolution. For example, a spruce hardwood forest with balsam fir, red spruce, white pine, and yellow birch. What are introduced plant species? also known as exotic, alien, or non-native plants. These are plants living outside their native distribution range, introduced into a region by human activity, either intentionally or inadvertently. For example, the Cornus cusa. The impact of introduced plants is variable. Some plants may have little or no impact while others have substantial negative impact on local ecosystems. Invasive plant species. These are introduced plants that cause ecologic, environmental, and or economic damage in their new location, spreading naturally. For example, purple loosestrife. Let's next, I'll now review the importance of coevolution of native plants and birds. Native plants and native birds have evolved together over millions of years and are mutually dependent. Birds eat the fruits, buds, and nectars of plants, thereby pollinating plants and dispersing their seed. Seeds are dispersed by attaching to feathers being carried on beaks or claws during and after feeding and through fecal material. The high nitrogen content in bird excrement serves as fertilizer for the seed. In Eastern deciduous forests, at least 300 trees, shrubs, and vines depend solely on birds to spread their seeds. In addition, plants have evolved to promote seed dispersal. Brightly colored fruits attract birds who have an acute sense of vision and color discrimination. Some berries and fruits have waxy coatings that reflect ultraviolet light, visible to birds, but not humans. Shrubs and trees without brightly colored fruits have bright stems and brilliant fall leaves that attract birds when their fruit ripens. Long Island and Plum Island are part of the Atlantic Flyway, one of the major north-south routes for bird migration. For a successful annual migration, birds must consume large quantities of highly nutritious food to quickly refuel. Fruits, otherwise known as berries, are the major food source for many songbirds 
during fall migrations along the Atlantic Flyway. What can we do to support migrating and overwintering birds? Provide berries for birds, but not all berries are the same. How do native and non-native berries compare? The nutritional value of native berries is greater than that of invasive berries. However, invasive plants may have high growth rates and a competitive advantage. Invasive shrubs mainly produce berries in the fall, depriving birds of optimal energy sources for migration if they are the predominant berries available. If birds are attracted to and consume the fruit of invasive species, this will accelerate habitat change and range expansive of invasives. For example, this is the range of the multiflora rose in 2006. Compare it to the range of the multiflora rose in 2014. Observational studies from a northeastern forest have shown the following. Birds prefer native berries when they have the option. Migrating birds will not stay long in an invasive predominant habitat, but will linger in habitats with native berries. The most abundant native berries are consumed at a faster rate than invasive berries. As preferred foods are exhausted, berries that have been ignored are added to the diet. However, bird preferences between native and invasive berries are still a puzzle and an area of ongoing scientific research. Let's look at my curated list of Long Island native berries by season. Other species in the same genus may also be suitable. Berries differ in the amounts of sugars, fatty acids, and other nutrients and ripen in different seasons. The first category of berries that I'll discuss are spring and summer berries. These sweet fruits predominate in the spring and summer. The surface berry is a small tree with stunning white flowers in early spring, red berries, good autumn color, and ornamental gray bark. It is tolerant of salt, soil compaction, and drought. It is susceptible to rust diseases. The fruits may be eaten fresh, used in pies, or preserves. Most of us have never tasted the small fruits of service berries because they don't reach peak ripeness, a dark purple-blue color, until well after a flock of cedar waxwings has swept in and devoured them. However, the larger fruit of the Saskatoon service berry a different species native along the Pacific coast, Western Canada, and Minnesota are commercially available and are used to bake June berry pie. Here's a nice recipe for June berry pie. The fruit of the service berry is eaten by at least 26 species, including the cedar waxwing, purple finch, and scarlet tanager. The next berry that I'd like to discuss is the red mulberry. The red mulberry tree typically grows 35 to 50 feet. Its fruits attract insects eating birds, otherwise known as insectivorous birds. These fruits are also used for jellies and jams, but are also not commercially available due to their short shelf life. They are tolerant of drought and air pollution. The fruit of the red mulberry is, at least, is eaten by at least 21 species, including the American goldfinch, Baltimore oriole, cedar waxwing, and the eastern tohe. Wild cherry is an important source of summer berries. It typically grows 50 to 80 feet. 
It has fragrant white flowers. The wood is valuable for furniture, is valued for furniture veneers. However, it is susceptible to leaf spot, powdery mildew, black knot, 10 caterpillars, and Japanese beetles. The black cherry ranks number two in the number of caterpillars it supports on its foliage. The fruit is eaten by more than 22 bird species, including the cedar waxwing, the downy woodpecker, and the viri. The second category of berries that I'd like to discuss are autumn berries. These berries ripen in late summer or early fall and become available just before the southbound migration. Autumn fruits are high in calorie-rich fatty acids, often 50% fat by weight. Birds depend on the fat of fall berries to fuel migration or to build fat reserves for the winter months if they overwinter. The spice bush is an underused multi-season shrub noted for its very early fragrant yellow flowers, red berries, and lovely yellow autumn color. There are separate sexes with red berries on the females. It is sometimes browsed by deer, but is not a favorite. The fruit of the spice bush is eaten by at least 15 species, including the great crested flycatcher, the red-eyed vireo, and the wood thrush. The red twig dogwood is an excellent alternative to the flowering dogwood, which cannot be recommended due to its susceptibility to anthracnose. It's a medium-sized, multi-season shrub whose bright red stems are excellent for winter interest. The red twig dogwood can be affected by powdery mildew and leaf spot late in summer. It attracts butterflies and other pollinators. Deer may browse it, but it is not a preferred plant. The fruit of the red twig dogwood is eaten by at least 16 species, including the cedar waxwing, northern cardinal, northern flicker, and pine grosbeak. Fragrant sumac has a lot to recommend as a source of autumn berries. It is a low colony forming shrub with glossy dark green aromatic summer foliage and excellent autumn color. It has a slow to moderate growth rate and is useful for ground cover and steep slope stabilization. It is tolerant of extreme drought and is rarely browsed by deer. The fruit of the fragrant sumac is eaten by at least 31 species, including the American robin, cedar waxwing, eastern bluebird, and pileated woodpecker. The staghorn sumac is a wonderful choice too. American elder or elderberry are found near ponds, streams, and wetlands. It spreads by suckers and forms colonies. It's an excellent plant for caterpillars and is not generally preferred by deer. The American elder is a favorite of cedar waxwings, which like to feed in flocks. There are many species of invasive autumn berries. These berries ripen in late summer or early fall and become available just before the southbound migration. They are high in sugar, but low in calorie-rich fatty acids, often less than 1% fat by weight. Examples are Japanese honeysuckle, European cranberry bush, and myelaminate. The last category of berries that I'd like to discuss are native autumn berries persisting into winter. Persistent fruits are available later in the fall season and winter. They are an important source of food for overwintering birds and early spring migrants. They have a lower lipid content than other autumn berries, but are less prone to turn rancid 
and rot on the vine. The smooth witherod viburnum is a medium to large shrub known for spring flowers, showy fruits, and good autumn color. It is an excellent plant for caterpillars and is not generally browsed by deer. The fruits of viburnums are eaten by brown thrasher, rose-breasted grosbeak, and white-eyed vireo. The red chokeberry is an underused, medium-sized, multi-season shrub noted for its profuse white flowers, berries, superior autumn color, and colorful bark. The black chokeberry is closely related. It is drought tolerant. However, it is irresist irresistible to deer. The fruit of the red chokeberry is eaten by the cedar waxwing, the black capped chickadee, and the tufted titmouse. Winterberry is a holly known for its profusion of small red berries from mid autumn through winter. It looks beautiful with a background of evergreens or snow. The winterberry is tolerant of moderate drought. There are separate sexes and the male plant must be present for the female plant to produce berries. Deer will frequently browse its leaves. The fruit of the winterberry is eaten by at least 12 species. It is preferred by the Northern Mockingbird, Great Catbird, and Hermit Thrush. The American Holly is also an excellent choice for winter berries. The Eastern Red Cedar is the most widely distributed conifer in the East and is an important plant for wildlife, providing good nesting and roosting cover for many species of birds as well as cover for mammals. There are separate sexes with berries on the female plant in fall in winter. It is among the first trees to appear after land is cleared. The foliage is frequently browsed by deer. The fruit of the Eastern red cedar is eaten by cedar waxwings, finches, warblers, songbirds, and game birds. It supports many butterfly larvae and is the primary host for the juniper hair streak. The northern bayberry is a fast grower with a relatively short lifespan. It is related to the southern wax myrtle. Male and female flowers appear on separate plants. It is tolerant of high wind, salt spray, and drought. Deer do not readily browse it. It is the absolute favorite berry of the yellow rumped warbler. There are several other native berries persisting into winter, the American beauty berry, the crab apple, and the Virginia creeper. Also, the hawthorn is enjoyed by a robin during the winter. There are several native vines that produce berries that persist into winter. Poison ivy fruit grows in conspicuous clusters and is slow to fall to the ground. It may be the most fully eaten of any berries in temperate forests of the Northeast. The berries of the American bittersweet also persist into winter and its berry-laden branches are prized as indoor decorations. Collections of branches has significantly reduced the native population. The native species of American bittersweet may be mistaken for the invasive oriental bittersweet which can girdle and overtop adjacent vegetation to the detriment of native species. Here's how to distinguish the invasive from the native species. If the bittersweet is in fruit, the color and location of the berries are distinguishing characteristics. If the bittersweet is in flower, the location of the flowers 
and color of the pollen distinguishes the two species. Invasive autumn berries also persist into winter. They are available later in the fall season and winter than native fruits. These berries have a lower percentage of fat and energy density than native berries. However, they are a major resource for wintering birds as the supply of native berries are depleted. Let's take a closer look at the cedar waxwing. It's been called a glutton for berries. John James Audubon wrote in 1842, the appetite of the cedar bird is of so extraordinary a nature as to prompt it to devour every fruit or berry that comes its way. Cedar berries are the fruit of choice of the cedar waxwing. The spring diet is composed of 44% flowers, 50% fruit, and the rest insects. In June, berries spike to 65% of the diet and continue to increase during the rest of the summer until it nears 100% for several winter months. What are our challenges? A massive decline in bird population was documented in an article by Rosenberg published in Science in 2019. The graph on the far left shows that there has been a decline in 2.9 billion birds between 1917 and the late 20-teens. On the right, the graph shows the proportion of species declining according to habitat. For the eastern forest, it has declined almost 20%. The causes of bird population decline are habitat loss, plant choice, invasive species, pesticide use in breeding and wintering areas, light pollution, climate change, insect decline, cat predation, and human-caused mortality, such as unregulated hard harvest, building and automobile collisions, and electrocutions due to power line collisions. A word about habitat loss. Grass has replaced over 40 million acres of diverse native plant communities. In new suburban developments, over 90% of the landscape is planted in grass. Grass chemicals, over-fertilization, increased water consumption, and mower emissions all contribute to a negative environmental impact. An important concept to understand going forward is what is meant by biodiversity. Biodiversity is the richness and variety of life. It refers to genes, species, and ecosystems. It is measured by the number of species in a given location. Each species has a specific role in maintaining balance within the ecosystem. Biodiverse ecosystems can better withstand environmental stresses. I would next like to define what is meant by the food chain and food webs. The food chain is the linear movement of energy through the ecosystem. Plants convert solar energy to food through photosynthesis. Plant-eating animals are eaten by flesh-eating animals, also known as the predator chain. All food chains in a single ecosystem are known as the food web. Each org organism in an ecosystem is part of multiple food chains. Why are insects important? Insects are the basis of all food webs. Insects are vital pollinators and recyclers of ecosystems. To fully comprehend the importance of insects, I would like to tell you about E.O. Wilson's 1987 thought experiment. He asked, what would happen if humans disappeared? If humans were 
beings were to disappear tomorrow, the world would go on with little change and set about healing itself and turning itself to the rich environmental stat states of a few thousand years ago. What would happen if insects disappeared? I doubt that human species could last more than a few months. Most of the fishes, amphibians, birds, and mammals would crash into extinction. Next would go the bulk of flowering plants. The possibility of E.O. Wilson's thought experiment coming true was considered unlikely when it was first published, but now the threat of insect loss has become a reality. The Crayfeld Entomological Society was the first to raise the alarm. This society was established in 1905 in the small industrial town of Krefeld, Germany. It is a group of about 50 amateur entomologists. They began collecting flying insects in 1982 with identical traps in the same locations with a standardized method for weighing the insects. The data was first published in 2013, reanalyzed and republished in 2017 in PLOS One, an open sourced online publication. This graph of the Crayfield data compares the mass of insects collected from May to October in the years 1989 and 2013. The results are astounding. The mass of insects declined 78% in 24 years. According to The Economist, the Krefeld Entomological Society paper was the third most frequently cited scientific study in the world in 2017. The following year, 2018, the New York Times Sunday Magazine cover story was entitled, The Insect Apocalypse is Here, what does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? A 2022 survey of native pollinators in New York State showed that 23% of species were at risk, 15% of species had not been seen since the year 2000, and more than 50% of insects were insecure. I know that statistics and graphs are hard to relate to. Consider then the windshield phenomena or the observation that fewer dead insects accumulate on the windshields of people's cars since the 2000s. When was the last time that you needed to clean your windshield because it was covered with dead insects? What are the causes of insect population decline? Habitat loss, plant choice, invasive species, pesticide use, light pollution, and climate change. Are declines in insects and insectivorous birds related? Doug Tallamy further analyzed the data from Rosenberg's 2019 article and found a strong relationship between insect decline and bird decline. This 2021 figure shows that there was roughly a 10 million decline per species of birds for whom insects were essential. There was no significant change in populations of birds where insects were not essential. Caterpillars are the larval stage of the order Lepidoptera, comprising butterflies and moths. 97% of North American terrestrial birds rear their young on caterpillars and adult moths with soft bodies rather than seeds, berries, or hard-shelled insects. Caterpillars have high amounts of proteins, fats, and carotenoids, which improve color vision and reproduction and are a major component of colorful feather pigments. Nestlings eat full caterpillar meals 
30 to 40 times daily. Habitats that do not contain enough caterpillars are not suitable for successful breeding. Insects and plants have also co-evolved. There are specialized relationships between most plant-eating insects and the plants they eat. 90% of plant-eating insects are diet specialists. They only consume plants with which they share an evolutionary history. Plants have evolved to defend themselves against being eaten by manufacturing chemicals stored in leaves. These chemicals make the plant distasteful or toxic to insects. However, insects have evolved to detoxify or excrete these compounds, thereby making the plant palatable. What are the best host plants for Lepidoptera? In 2009, Doug Calamy compared the value of native versus introduced plants and their ability to serve as host plants for Lepidoptera. As you can see on the graph on the right, native plants supported more species than introduced plants and woody plants, i.e. trees and shrubs, supported more Lepidoptera species than herbaceous plants. What are our solutions? Plant keystone plants. Native plants differ by orders of magnitude in their ability to host insects. Approximately 5% of our local plants host 70 to 75% of the local category species. These hyperproductive plants are called keystone plants. Without keystone plants, the local food web falls apart. Keystone plants regenerate biodiversity. They support insects, which then support animals that feed on them. Most animals do not eat plants directly, but eat insects that feed on plants. Planting keystone plants increases the number of species or biodiversity in the local ecosystem. Here are keystone plant rankings for Lepidoptera species. Oaks rank number one in their ability to host Lepidoptera. Cherries and plums rank number two. Third are willows. Fourth are birches, followed by poplars and cottonwoods. And the last, or number six, are crab apples, which support 308 species. There are rankings also for herbaceous plants that are best at supporting insects. The number one ranking plant is our goldenrods, asters, and sunflowers. What are other solutions for the biodiversity crisis? E.O. Wilson published Half Earth, Our Planet's Fight for Life in 2016. The Half Earth proposal offers a solution commensurate with the magnitude of the problem. Only by setting aside half the planet in reserve or more can we save the living part of the environment and achieve the stabilization required for our own survival. The United Nations Biodiversity Conference was held in Montreal in December 2022. The key concept is 30 by 30. 190 countries approved a UN agreement to protect 30% of the world's land, inland waters, coastal areas, and oceans by the year 2030. $200 billion a year were pledged for this global diversity fund. However, formal US participation in the conference was blocked by congressional Republicans and the biodiversity funding gap has been estimated to be about $700 billion per year. 
President Biden signed an executive action directing the Interior Department to outline steps to achieve his commitment <clears throat> to conserve at least 30% of United States lands and waters by 2030. <clears throat> Doug Tallamy thinks about solutions for the biodiversity in crisis in an entirely different way. <clears throat> in the past, conservationist works exclusively where people weren't. We now need to save nature where people are. Doug Tallamy is a professor of agriculture in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. His practical solutions are described in his 2019 book, Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your yard. What are the key concepts? Conservation of private property where people live and work, a grassroots approach to conservation. It relies on the initiatives of private individuals to turn their yards into conservation corridors, which he names homegrown national parks. How do you turn your yard into a conservation corridor? Plant keystone plants, remove invasive plants, reduce lawn area, and don't use pesticides. Like any other project rooted in science, a key component is to measure conservation progress by having each individual document their native plant efforts on the map. Here's a map of Suffolk County. The dragonfly on the eastern tip of the North Fork is my home in Orient. The goal of homegrown national park is to have 20 million acres of land planted in natives. This represents half the amount of land currently planted in grass. Here's a close up of active homegrown national park members in East Marion and Orient. Thanks to a generous donation from the late Rick Kedenberg, North Fork Audubon will be planting a Berry for Birds demonstration garden at our headquarters at Inlet Pond County Park. We're naming it after Rick's favorite bird, the Eastern Tohe. Here are my take home messages. Plant berry producing trees and shrubs to support birds. Plant keystone plants to promote biodiversity. Join Homegrown National Park. I would like to acknowledge the, the following people who were instrumental in development of the Berry for Birds initiative at North Fork Autumn Bond Society. Thank you very much.